Hello and welcome to Wild West Faces. Today's story talks about a large wagon train that was headed west from Missouri to California. They encountered some Indians who at first seemed like it was going to be a pretty tense situation, but everything worked out okay. Then, one young man from the wagon train almost ruined it for everybody. Listen to this exciting story here on Wild West Faces. <laughs> When the emigrants organized, ready to travel to California, I was living at Huntsville in Madison County where I joined one of the parties known as Captain Boyd's Train. A man of the name of John Mankins, formerly of Marion County, joined the other party. He was a large man and bore the name of being quite overbearing and disagreeable. When he left Marion County to join the emigrants, he was living in the Flippin' Barrens between Yellville and White River. The two wagon trains after starting traveled together for a while but finally separated, often they were ten miles apart. Before reaching the frontier, Mankins made many boasts that he would shoot the first of the Indian race he saw, be it man, woman, or child. The man repeated these threats so frequently after arriving on the frontier that the remainder of the party grew alarmed and tried to induce him to not to do so for fear the entire party would be massacred. Being a long-headed and don't-care sort of fellow, he paid no attention to their advice. Arriving at an Indian reservation, and while passing on they reached an encampment where there were only a few women and children at camp, the warriors being away on a hunt. This gave the man an opportunity to carry his threats into execution, and he willfully murdered a squaw by shooting her. The other emigrants deplored the cold-blooded, wicked act of the heartless man. They knew the tribe would avenge the death of the woman. They traveled on with the expectation of being attacked every hour, but they were not molested until the fourth day after the woman was killed, when the emigrants saw a band of Indians coming in pursuit. They were all mounted on ponies and numbered 100. Each warrior was in full war paint. The emigrants were in camp some 10 miles from our train. The Indians came with a rush and without making a halt to parley surrounded the camp and demanded the murderer, or they would kill and scalp all the members of the train including women and children. The white men were well armed and had made preparation for defense should the whole party be attacked. On the demand of the warriors, the leaders found that they were too small in number to resist the enraged Indians, even if they wanted to. Mankins had committed such a wicked murder that they had no sympathy for him and they handed him over at once. The fury of the band rose to a high pitch and they informed the white men that they were going to inflict one of the most painful tortures known to the murderer. The prisoner knew he was doomed to a terrible fate, and the trembling wretch begged and implored the white men to save him from the vengeance of the red men, but his pleading was in vain. He had brought it on himself, and he would have to pay the penalty that suited the desire and thirst of the warriors. The Indians took a rope off of one of their ponies, 60 feet long, that was made from the raw hide of buffalo, and bound the man head and foot to one of the hind wheels of a wagon. The Indians did not delay much time in preliminaries when they examined their knives to see that they had keen edges, and the awful scene of flaying a man alive began. They began at the neck and the man's blood was soon flowing little streams down his nude body, for they had stripped him of all his clothes. They slowly but surely took the skin from his entire body not in small bits or strips, but whole. The awful torture was done in the presence of the white men. Mankin struggled and screamed in agony. His suffering was terrible and miserable. He begged, prayed, and cursed. The bloody work went on. The unbearable torture was continued. The man had cruelly murdered a poor defenseless Indian woman, and the tribe she belonged to were punishing him with the worst torture they could devise. The exultant Indians finished their horrible and painful work and gave a yell of delight. Their victim was still alive, but had become unconscious. They unbound him, and the bleeding, writhing form dropped to the ground where it lay quivering for an hour, when death put an end to life and further cruelty by the Indians. Not an Indian left until they were satisfied he was dead. They then mounted their ponies, and with war whoops they departed, carrying the human hide with them. Soon after the yelling warriors had passed from their view, the emigrants dug a grave at the spot where the dead body of the man lay and gave it decent burial. 
They marked the grave as well as circumstances would admit. In an hour after the interment of Mankin's lifeless form, the party of white people took its departure from the place where the blood-curdling scene was enacted, leaving the new-made grave for the coyotes to howl over, and the buffalo to trample on, and the passing Indians to sneer at. Captain A. Wood Major North's company of Pawnee scouts arrived here a few days ago and went into camp near the fort. They are mustered out and were on their way to their reservation in the Indian Territory. They are fine-looking, orderly disposed, and a well-disciplined body of men. One of their number named Red Willow, said to be the son of a once famous chief, was shot by one of Hayes City's loafers, a mean, low, cowardly, treacherous desperado whose hand seems always ready to commit some mean, low, cowardly act when his victims are unprepared. The sad affair occurred on Monday night last, and one paper and some of the people of this city place it under the heading of Attempted Burglary, probably to screen the good name of the village or to lionize the banditti who fired those unfortunate shots. But, Mr. Editor, the character of that scoundrel is too well known. Only the preceding night he pounded a Mr. Hill over the head and left him senseless on the sidewalk, where he lay wallowing in his own blood until the following morning. And it is said that Mr. Hill, at the time he came to his consciousness, discovered that he was minus a watch and some cash. Again, to show the cowardice of this would-be Wild Bill imitator, I would say that on an occasion which took place recently, he drew his revolver on one of the boys in blue against whom he had a petty spite, owing to one of the soiled doves at a house of ill repute here. But policeman Charlie slipped behind a corner and drew out an old army revolver without charge, cock, or trigger, and politely requested our desperado to drop that shooting iron. And you may well bet he dropped it like a hot potato, but remarked, Charlie, I wasn't going to shoot you. I thought you was another man I was looking for. Just so Jack and that other man will find you one of these fine days better prepared than Charlie on this occasion referred to. The fort to which my father belonged was three quarters of a mile from his farm. But when this fort went to decay and was unfit for use, a new one was built near our own house. I well remember, when a little boy, the family were sometimes waked up in the dead of night by an express with the report that the Indians were at hand. The express came softly to the door and by a gentle tapping raised the family. This was easily done as an habitual fear made us ever watchful and sensible to the slightest alarm. The whole family were instantly in motion. My father seized his gun and other implements of war. My mother waked up and dressed the children as well as she could. Being myself the oldest of the children, I had to take my share of the burdens to be carried to the fort. There was no possibility of getting a horse in the night to aid us. Besides the little children, we caught up such articles of clothing and provisions as we could get hold of in the dark, for we durst not light a candle or even stir the fire. All this was done with the utmost dispatch and in the silence of death. The greatest care was taken not to awaken the youngest child. To the rest, it was enough to say Indian and not a whisper was heard afterward. 
Thus it often happened that the whole number belonging to a fort, who were in the evening at their homes, were all in their little fortress before the dawn of the next morning. In the course of the next day, their household furniture was brought in by men under arms. Some families belonging to each fort were much less under the influence of fear than others. These often, after an alarm had subsided in spite of every remonstrance, would remove home, while their more prudent neighbors remained in the fort. Such families were denominated foolhardy and gave no small amount of trouble by creating such frequent necessities of sending runners to warn them of their danger and sometimes parties of our men to protect them during their removal.